Hello, everyone. Welcome to the African Exodus Show. I'm your host, Tierney Cherie. Before I get started with this next segment, I do want to remind you all to please join the Telegram group for African Exodus if you want to get notifications about videos that I post. YouTube is not good at notifying you and YouTube be on some shadow shadow banning stuff. So definitely do subscribe there. So I want to go into this week's Hidden Revelations. We're going to finish up, I believe we're going to finish up for now at least, the series on Africa is the Holy Land. This presentation today I think will be probably the most important one of the series because this one is the one that really drove the point home for me. That is reading the book of Jubilees and how Jubilees actually does clearly identify not only the Garden of Eden but also Shem's territory which includes Israel or Israel. So we're going to talk about this and before we get into it we also have to talk about what it is that makes Eden Eden. Now we're going to jump right in. Genesis 2, 10 through 14. That is where you have a description of the Garden of Eden. So like I said, this presentation is about Jubilees, but to understand what Jubilees is talking about, you have to first go to Genesis. So what is the Garden of Eden geographically? It says, and a river went out of Eden to the water, to water the garden, and from thence it parted and became into four heads. The name of the first is Pison, that is that which compasseth the whole land of Hivala, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. There is Bedellium and the onyx stone. The name of the second river is Gihon. The name, the same is that which compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. And the name of the third river is Hedeko. That is it which goeth towards east of Assyria. And the fourth is the river Euphrates. Four rivers that were given. Four rivers that flow out of Eden. Now, I want to say biblical scholars have said that the Hidhidikel is the Tigris River. Doesn't make sense. And then they said, obviously, the Euphrates, as it has written in here, they said that that is the Euphrates that we know of today. The actual word for Euphrates is Pereth. So that's what it actually is inside of the scriptures. They've said that the Euphrates is the Pereth. Now, the problem is that even biblical scholars acknowledge they have a problem. These two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, well, they would have to be connected to two other rivers. They say, though, that the answer might be that there are some prehistoric rivers that have not been discovered because it is true that geography changes over time. Rivers dry up. We're going to talk about one river that absolutely did dry up in this presentation. But their argument has been that this is why we can't find the other four rivers. And they've done all of this because they want to put the Garden of Eden inside of the territory that we know today as the Middle East or in Arabia. So biblical scholars, unfortunately, will instead try to make this case that some rivers basically dried up and that Euphrates and the Tigris used to be connected to two other rivers. And all of these basically put the Garden of Eden inside of Arabia. But well, this doesn't make sense for a couple of other reasons. If you read again where it says the river peace on the compass of the whole land of Havala. I'm going to say that it's very obvious that Havala is Africa, where it says there's somewhere that's rich in gold, bedellum, onyx stone. Obviously, Africa is the most minerally rich continent on the earth, period. So the act, the idea that this would be somewhere in Arabia that's not the minerally, most minerally rich continent on the earth, I think that that's laughable personally. But let's just say that that's, uh, let's say that that's circumstantial evidence. Well, the Gihon River, the same river that compasses the whole land of Ethiopia. The Gihon River, which I will go into later, the Nile River, that cannot connect to the Euphrates or the Tigris, no matter how much you try to pretend that it does. But this is the problem that they're faced with. That's not the problem that we're faced with today because we're not even putting those as the Tigris in the Euphrates the the or the Hedekel and the Euphrates, the Hedekel River we will go into, but the Euphrates again, as I said before, is the blue now. Let's go into the Book of Jubilees, though. I want to qualify the Book of Jubilees because the Book of Jubilees might not be inside of your Bible if you have a uh, a, a normal King James Bible. It's a book that was was removed from the canon. But it's a book that's still sacred, and it's a book that's still scripture. So let's talk about why. 
The Book of Jubilees sometimes has been called the Lesser Genesis. It's an ancient Hebrew religious work of 50 chapters, considered canonical by the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and as Beta, and Beta Israel. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church, a church that arose basically inside of Ethiopia, obviously, has always held that this book is canonical, where it is known as the Book of Division. Jubilees is considered one of the pseudepigrapha by the Roman Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox Protestant churches. They call it pseudepigrapha. This word essentially means that these are books that they're not even going to acknowledge as being possibly biblical. They're saying that these books were written by someone else, that these books are inaccurate. This is the label that the Roman Catholic Church has put on Jubilees, and they've done it to a number of other scriptures because they don't want to acknowledge the truth of them. Now it says it this book though, Book of Jubilees, it was known to early Christians, evidenced by the writings of Ephanius, Justine the Martyr, um, Origen, the Doris of Tarsus, Isidore of Alexandria, Isidore of Seville, Etuichius, I'm sure I'm butchering these names, of Alexandria, John Malalas, George Sinchilus, of George Cetranos. So this is a book that was known to early uh, early Christ Christians, but most importantly, it was known to the Hebrews. This was a book that was held as sacred to the Hebrews. And that is evidenced by the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's been no complete Greek or Latin version known to have survived, but the Gese version has been shown to be accurate translation of the verses found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The reason why is because somehow... The Ethiopian church has been the only one that's been able to keep and maintain this scripture. It has not been able to be maintained by any other church because the Catholic church had labeled it pseudopigrapha, if I pronounced that word right either too, but they pronounced, they, they, they labeled it as so. And basically it became illegal to read the scripture. You could not read the book of Jubilees and not face persecution by the Catholic church. So it was hidden. I want to go into more about the pseudepigraphal, uh, the, the label. So there's two books considered canonical in the Orthodox Tewahado churches. Those are the Ethiopian churches. They are the Book of Enoch and the Book of Jubilees. They're categorized as pseudepigrapha from the point of view of Chaldean Christianity. It was so thoroughly suppressed in the 4th century that no complete... Hebrew, Greek, or Latin version has survived. Jubilees is preserved in its entirety only in the Ethiopian translation, which was derived from a Greek translation made from the Hebrews. That would be the Septuagint. Fragments of the Greek and the Hebrew text are also exact. So what does Jubilees have that would make the Catholic Church want to suppress it, want to basically ban the book and punish with even death with some cases, people who would go against them and actually read these books? So Jubilees proves that this map right here is inaccurate. This idea that Japheth is, your, is Europe, that Shem is the Arabian Peninsula, and that Ham is just all of Africa. That's what Jubilees proves is inaccurate. Among a number of other things, there's a, honestly a number of reasons why the Catholic Church might have banned Jubilees. But with no further ado, let's actually go through reading the scripture. So Jubilees 8, 12 through 17. And there came from the writings as Shem's lot of the middle of the earth, which he should take as an inheritance for himself, and for his sons for generations from eternity. From the middle of the mountain range of Rapha, from the mouth of the water, from the river Tina, and his portion goes towards the west through the midst of this river, and extends till it reaches the waters of the abysses, out of which this river goes forth and pours its waters into the sea Miat. This river flows into the great sea, and all that is towards the north is Japheth's, and all that is towards the south belongs to Shem, and it extends till it reaches Caruso. This is the bottom of the tongue which looks towards the south, and its portion extends along the great sea, and it extends in a straight line till it reaches the west of the tongue which looks towards the south. For this sea is named the tongue of the Egyptian sea. 
And it turns from here towards the south, towards the mouth of the great sea on the shore of its waters, and then extends to the west to Afra. And it extends till it reaches the waters of the river Gihon and to the south of the river waters of Gihon to the banks of this river. And it extends towards the east till it reaches the garden of Eden to the south thereof, to the south and from the east of the whole land of Eden and from the whole east, it turns to the east and proceeds till it reaches the east of the mountain named Rapha and it descends to the bank of the mouth of the river Tina. The, this portion came forth from the lot for Shem and for his sons that they should possess it forever unto his generations forevermore okay so that was a lot and many of much of it you probably don't necessarily understand i mean some are obvious when it says egyptian sea but let's just qualify these locations rafa mountains i'm going to explain to you the rafa mountains are the hijaz mountains the river tina i'm going to survive to explain to you is the kuwait river this is an ancient river that has since dried up the miat sea the persian gulf the Great Sea is the Arabian Sea. The Caruso, the Sinai Peninsula, the Egyptian Sea, obviously the Red Sea. Afra, obviously Africa. And the Gihon River, as I said, the Nile River. So let's go through these locations and see if I qualify enough for you. So the River Tina is the Kuwait River. We're gonna go to a reading really quickly and I'm going to tell you about this river that has since dried up. Close examination of images from Earth satellites have revealed traces of an ancient river under the sands of Arabia, which originated in the Hejaz Mountains of western Saudi Arabia and flowed eastward more than 500 miles across the desert to the Arabian Gulf. There it formed a delta that once covered much of Kuwait, according to Dr. Farouk El Baz, director of the Center for Remote Sensing at Boston University, who reported the finding last week. He believed this explained a gravel found in much of Kuwait formed from granite and volcanic basalt unrelated to rock. It now appears to have been carried across Arabia from the distant mountains. This is actually very amazing because it literally is what Jubilee says about the Tina River. So to review, it says from the middle of the mountain range of Rafa, from the mouth of the water from the river Tina. From the middle of a mountain range called Rafa, a river flows out of this mountain range. This river was called Tina. Now, again, this does not match anything today. But if you look at what's happening today with this dried up river and with the location that it comes from, it clearly see, shows that this is the Hejaz Mountains. But let's qualify that, that it is actually the Hejaz Mountains. Um, so the Hejaz Mountains they are, are inside of the Arabian Peninsula. They reach up towards the current state, the modern state of Israel, and they go down the Arabian Peninsula. Now, the reason why I say that the Hejaz Mountains are, Raf, are the Rafa Mountains, first of all, when you go to the top of the mountain range, Rafa. Rafa is actually a location that exists today. That is the Gaza Strip. In ancient times, it was known as Rafia. So it's very evident that Rafa Mountains must be referring to this location as this is the only mountain range close to this ancient place called Rafa. If you want to know more about Rafia, Rafa, this is where Ptolemy Pol Pol V and Cle Cleopatra's wedding took place. So the next location, the Gihon. The Gihon is the now. That is actually something that is a clear fact, and yet people might try to deny it in order to work some type of way where the Euphrates is the Euphrates and the Tigris are the Tigris. But let's qualify what I'm saying. Genesis 13, they sa it says, and the name of the second river is Gihon. The same is it that compasseth the whole land of Ethiopia. So the Gihon would have to go through the land of Ethiopia. If you don't know, Ethiopia in biblical times, it was not the country Ethiopia. It was a name basically for East Africa. Now, what it says inside of the, what it says inside of the Jewish encyclopedia is that this Gihon River, which is surrounding the whole land of Kush or Ethiopia, its identification has been a matter of dispute among biblical exegetes and critics. Josephus, Josephus has identified the Gihon with the now. If you don't know who Josephus is, he's someone who a lot of biblical scholars give a lot of credence to. He said that the Gihon was the now. 
The Septuagint, which is more important to me personally, the Septuagint renders Sihor, the now, but the Midrash and later commentators as Sadai and Rashi think the Pisan, the river of Eden, to be the now. So there's a reason for that because the Midrash is, if you don't know, it's the Jewish biblical exegesis um, used by the rabbinical Judaism. So basically rabbinic Judaism says that the Gihon is not the now, but that's because it will put the Garden of Eden inside of Arabia instead of putting it inside of Africa. But again, the Septuagint, which is older than Midrash, the Septuagint, which is longer held and and more followed than the Midrash and also than the Talmud. The Septuagint puts the Gihon as being the now, and that's very significant. So now that we've established these locations, let's put the actual locations inside of Jubilees and see what we come up with. I'm going to map this out so that you can watch clearly how Jubilees identifies East Africa as being the lot of Shem, as well as Arab parts of Arabia too. So it said, and there came forth on the writings as Shem's lot, the middle of the earth, which he should take as an inheritance for himself and for his sons for, for the generations of eternity. From the middle of the mountain range of the Hejaz Mountains, from the mouth of the water from the river Kuwait, the ancient river, that's in parentheses from me, and his portion goes towards the west through the midst of this river and extends till it reaches the waters of the abysses, out of which this river goes and pours its waters into the Persian Gulf. And this river flows into the Arabian Sea. And all that is towards the north is Japheth. And all that is towards the south belongs to Shem. And it extends till it reaches the Sinai Peninsula. This is the bosom of the tongue which looks towards the south. I'm going to pause right here and say it's amazing. This literally matches the, the Sinai Peninsula. It's the tongue that looks downward. And its portion extends along the Great Sea, and it extends in a straight line till it reaches the west of the tongue, which looks towards the south. For this sea is named the tongue of for this for this sea is named the tongue of the Red Sea. And it turns from here towards the south, towards the mouth of the Great Sea, on the shores of its waters. And it extends to the west to Africa. And it extends till it reaches the waters of the river now and to the south of the river of the waters of the now and to the banks of this river. And it extends towards the east till it reaches the Garden of Eden to the south thereof and to the east of the whole land of Eden of the whole east. It turns to the east and proceeds till it reaches the east of the mountain named Hejaz. And it descends to the bank of the mouth of the river Kuwait. Let's go back to Genesis 2, 10 through 14. Because this right here obviously shows where the Garden of Eden is. But how do we definitely know that that is the location? So again, we're given this image four rivers. One is going to be the peace sign that's going to go through the land of Hivala. I would say that the peace sign is probably the Zambezi River. That's what I strongly believe. It could also be the Congo River, but I lean towards the Zambezi River. Now, as far as the Gihon, we already said that that's the now. And we also said that the Hedekel is going to be the Kuwait River, an ancient river. And then we have the Euphrates, the blue now. All of these connect. And they connect, if you look at it, if you look at the map, they connect at a point that could easily be identified as clearly being the center of where the now would have to flow from. That is what we know today as Lake Victoria. That is inside of current Uganda. So that's where I would put the Garden of Eden. But definitely, even if not Uganda, this region would have to be the Garden of Eden from where these four rivers are going to flow. So just to give you some visuals of Uganda, so we have... Um, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda. This is the region where I believe that the Garden of Eden is located. And guess what? Oldest human fossil remains are also inside of this region. Wildlife, the animals are also in this region. The greenery, things that you might associate with Eden are all in this region. 
This is the Enkorongoro in Crater. Another possible, if not Eden, clearly something that you would look to as being an Eden. This place is inhabited by all sorts of wildlife, all sorts of diversity. Again, ancient human fossil remains, the things that you associate with Eden. So I want to read through Jubilees 8, 19 through 20, so that we understand the significance of the Garden of Eden being in Africa. And it said, and he knew that the Garden of Eden is the holy of holies and the dwelling place of Yah and Mount Sinai, the center of that of the desert and Mount Zion, the center of the navel of the earth. These three were created as holy places facing each other. And he blessed the Elohim of Elohim, who had put the word of the Lord in his, to his mouth and the Lord forevermore. So this tells you that Eden is not an insignificant place. It literally is the holy of holies. The, not just that, the Shem's lot. That is the holy of holies. This is why Africa is the holy land. It has not only Eden, it has not only Israel, but it also has Mount Zion. It has these locations that have been sanctified and set apart by God. Now, I want to give you a little um, food for thought. Many of you might have heard of the East African split. I'm going to play a very brief video that's going to talk about this split right Recently, now. Recently, Kenya's Great Rift Valley has become an area of interest to individuals worldwide. The never-ending exploratory activities in this region are triggered by the fact that it is the region where Africa, the second largest continent in the world, is gradually dividing into two as a result of natural forces. An event of this extent hasn't been recorded for a couple of million years. The division of the African continent into two became very obvious in 2005. This division originated from the emergence of a rift in the Ethiopian desert, which is 35 miles long at the moment. Great Rift Valley stretches from northern Ethiopia through the Mozambique and is the dividing line separating countries like Somalia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Mozambique, Djibouti, Kenya, and Tanzania from the remaining parts of Africa. Centering around this fact, scientists discovered the Victoria microplate situated between both sides of the rift. This is the largest microplate on Earth and has been rotating counterclockwise for more than two years. So when you consider what this video is saying, literally going back to Jubilees, this is what Jubilees identifies as the lot of Shem particularly the part that is Africa is splitting from the rest of the continent right as we speak. This is the first time that modern modern human civilization has seen this happen. And this, this split happening really recently to me is a telling sign that's, that, that we're honestly in the end times. So this is just some food for thought. I believe that this is a prophetic thing that's happening as far as basically the split happening. It could be a number of things. It could be another of reasons, but I definitely think that it's something that's going to play out more and more and it's going to be seen as significant on the world stage. But with that, I would love to hear your thoughts on this about the book of Jubilees, about Eden, Israel, Israel, and really the entire lot of Shem being in Africa, because as we discussed, Arabia is Africa, despite what people want you to think. And um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And please, you know, keep the dialogue going, keep the conversation going. Anyone is welcome to share their opinions. As long as you're respectful, I don't mind. But with that, I thank you all, and I will see you on the next video. Negroland or Nigrisha was an archaic term in European mapping, describing the inland and, by Westerners, poorly explored region in West Africa as an area populated with Negro people. This area comprised at least the western part of the region called Sudan not to be confused with the modern country. The term is probably a direct translation of the Arabic term Balad al-Sudan meaning, ''Land of the Blacks'' corresponding to about the same area. There were various kinds of people in the area, including the Jews of Balad el-Sudan. Some of the greatest states of those considered part of Negroland were the Bornu Empire and the Sokoto Caliphate. Negroland represented the area between the region of Guinea and Zara, or the desert, the Sahara Desert, Guinea, not to be confused with the modern country, then referred to the south-facing coast of West Africa and the land stretching upriver from there. Herman Mall's 1727 map labels these Grain Coast, Slave Coast and Gold Coast. 
Negroland was the territory to the north of this, along the east-west axis of the Niger River, and the west-facing coast. Mall's map labels Gambia, Senegal, Mandinga, and many other territories. In 1823, approximately the same area was described as Nigrisha on an American map published by Fielding Lucas Jr. Zephaniah or Zephania, a Negro Israelite, a son of Cush. Zephania means Yahweh hides. Now, Zephania's father was named Cushi, and Cushi as an adjective that means black. In both Hebrew, it means black, and in Greek, it means black. Now, Cushi is an affectionate term for a Negro of Ethiopian origin, derived from the biblical land of Cush. And it is an area that was alongside the Niger River. And if you actually look at ancient maps in 1736 and ancient maps in 1747 of Africa, you'll find a country called Negro Land and the Kingdom of Judah. This is of utmost importance for us to understand how Yahweh is gathering the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. Because what actually happened is in this Gulf of Guinea in Western Africa, European slave ship holders, they were Ashkenazi slavers. They were of European origin. They were Western Mongols that had infiltrated Britain and mainly Portugal. They were the Ashkenazi slavers. They were wealthy merchant slavers that went down to the coast of Guinea. They employed Mohammedan trappers, Islamics, to go into the kingdom of Judah and Negro land and take the royal house of Judah captive in slave ships, as it's recorded in the book of Deuteronomy, and bring them over to America, and they became known today as what? African Americans. So, all that to say this, Zephania, of course, a Negro Israelite, more complex than what Bible scholars would just like to rush through because it is not politically expedient to them today. We're going to see, of course, this area of which Zephania, this area, of course, of which we're talking about, Negro land and the kingdom of Judah. If you were to look at an African map today, the kingdom of Judah, right on the Gulf of Guinea, appears today in present day, in the present day Republic of Benin and the nation of Togo. So if you look on a map today at the nation of Togo and the present Republic of Benin, that is where the kingdom of Judah and Negro land was. Emmanuel Bowen, a UK cartographer, designed this map and allotted this little space to the biblical people of Judah in West Africa. This map can be found in the library of Yale University. Herman Moe, landing based cartographer, allotted this portion of Guinea to the same people and attached the following note. I am credibly informed that a country about a hundred leagues north of the coast of Guinea is inhabited by white men or at least a different kind of people from the blacks who wear clothes and have use of letters, make silk, and some of them keep the Sabbat. This map can be found in the library of Princeton University. Johann Matthias Hayes, a German cartographer, indicated that they will have a larger real estate. His map can be found in the archives of Stanford University. Homanes, another German cartographer, agrees.
he allots the entire region of Guinea to the people of Judah. His map can be found in the Library of Congress, USA. These are many maps were provided by Europe's finest cartographers who provided direction to aid the European slave trade and colonial project. <laughs>